Hello everyone, this is Charlie from the Bloomingdale Public Library and welcome to Introduction to Ruby. So what is Ruby? It's a free to use open source programming language with the focus on simplicity and productivity. If you were to do an internet search for the easiest programming language to learn, you'd probably see Ruby near the top of the list. It's an interpreted language which means it runs without a compiler. And a compiler is something that changes programming code into machine code. Other examples of interpreted languages would be Python and JavaScript, while Java and C++ are languages that need to be compiled first. So basically, today we're gonna to be writing Ruby files and then executing them. Whereas with Java, you'd create Java files and then you'd have to turn them into binary files first before you can execute them. So we get to skip that step. And if none of that means anything to you, don't worry about it. Ruby is entirely object-oriented. This is a major programming concept where coding is based on working with objects. An object would belong to a class, and then that class would be loaded with properties and methods, which describe what an object is and what you can do with it. So for an example, if you had Spot the dog, Spot might belong to a dog class. And in that dog class, you can see that dogs all have a name, size, and location, and they have methods called eat and run. And then those methods, eat and run, would be ways to change the dog's size and location. So you might have heard of something called Ruby on Rails, and this is probably the biggest reason people learn Ruby. Ruby on Rails is more than just a programming language. It's something called a full stack framework, which is something used for building web applications. So it'll have tools for working with HTML, databases, etc., and all of that will be written in Ruby and running on Ruby. And if you wanted to learn Ruby on Rails, you should probably learn Ruby first. So some applications that run on Ruby on Rails would include Hulu, Airbnb, Shopify, and a whole bunch of others. Basically, Ruby on Rails had a period of popularity, and it's starting to wane a bit and giving way to Node and Django, which run on JavaScript and Python, respectively. And those are gaining popularity because they tend to run a bit faster when you start to scale up. OK, so now that we know a bit about what we're getting into, let's go ahead and download and install Ruby. To do that, we're gonna go ahead and open up a browser. If you're on a Windows machine, you're gonna go to rubyinstaller.org. And on the main page here, we're gonna click on the big red download button. That'll take us to the download page. And here on the left side, we've got a bunch of downloads, but what we want is the top one here. Unless you know you're running Windows on a 32-bit machine, in which case you want the one below it. So after the installer finishes, we're just gonna go ahead and run the installation file. If you're not sure where that pops up on your browser, you can just go to your download folder. It'll be this guy here, Ruby installer dash dev kit dash whatever version they're up to when you watch this video. You can just go ahead and run that. If you're not running Windows, what you're gonna do, if you do a Google search for Ruby install, we're gonna want the top return here. And that is gonna be for ruby-lang.org, and you see the rest of the URL there. If you go to this page, it'll have some tips for downloading and installing Ruby on Linux and Mac OS. So back to Windows, we're gonna go ahead and run the installer here. And installing for me is fine. If you wanna install for all users, you need to be logged in as an admin. You need to accept the license to continue. Go ahead and read through it. Hit next. On this page, you can choose where you install Ruby. I'd recommend just leaving it alone. Make sure the boxes are checked and then hit install. I'm not gonna do that because if I do that, it's gonna run an uninstall instead because I've already got it installed. You should see a green bar and it'll take a while to fill up. But once it does, you'll go to another screen with a checkbox, make sure it's checked, and then hit finish. When you do that, it will take you 
to a command window that looks something like this. Hit enter, you'll see a bunch of text scroll. After it's all done, hit enter again, and you've got Ruby installed. Okay, so with Ruby installed, we're ready to set up our workspace. Obviously things are going to vary a little bit depending on your operating system, but the ultimate goal is to have a text editor open on one side of the screen and a command line window open on the other. It also simplifies things a bit to have the command line window open to the directory where your Ruby files live, especially if you're not command line savvy. So I will show you how to do that. Let's start off with the text editor. In Windows, we're going to be using Notepad. It's a part of the default install. I've actually got Notepad tied to the taskbar here. Otherwise, you just need to click on the search icon or search field, type in Notepad, and it should come right up. With that open, just click and drag on the top of the window, bring it over to the side of the screen, and release the mouse button and it should cut the screen in half. So we'll have our text editor over on the left side and the command line window open on the right. All right, next, let's go ahead and create a directory for our Ruby files to live. You can use an existing directory if you like, not a big deal. I'm gonna go to Documents and right click in the window, go to New, go to Folder. And we'll title this folder Ruby. You can name your folder whatever you like, though. So go ahead, open up your Ruby folder. And it's going to be empty, but in order to open up the command line window uh, in the directory, we need to have it open. And in Windows 11, you can just right click and select Open in Terminal. Otherwise, in Windows 10, you hold down Shift and right click and choose Open PowerShell Window here. And it does just that. And again, all this does is it sets the command line to the correct directory. If you're command line savvy, you can go about doing that however you like. So just like with Notepad, I'm gonna click and drag the window, except we're gonna bring it over to the right side. And again, it'll cut the window in half. We'll go ahead and select Notepad again. And there you go, we're all set up for writing and executing our Ruby programs. Now there is something called an IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment, and that can certainly help streamline working with Ruby or whatever program a whole bunch, but setting one up can be a bit of a tutorial in itself, so I chose to forego that, and this will work for most of our purposes today anyway. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. It is a time-honored tradition for the first program in a new programming language to be the Hello World program. The whole point of the Hello World program is to put the words Hello World on the screen. It's generally a pretty short program, but it's nice proof to yourself that you can get something up and running. So let's go ahead and type out our code. We're gonna go ahead and click in the notepad window here, and then type out puts, space, double quote, hello world, and then another double quote. It's up to you if you want to capitalize it and put an exclamation point at the end, but that's typically what you see in the textbooks, again, for most programming languages. And that's it. That is our code for the hello world program. To execute this, we're going to need to go to file, and save as to name the file and save it. So where it says file name, we'll go ahead and type in a file name. Stick to letters and numbers. If you need to use a space, it's convention to use underscores. If you use regular spaces, you're gonna to need to put everything in quotes when you type it out in the command line. So I'm gonna name this practice. I will probably use this file for the rest of the class, just saving over what we do. And then after your title, you put .rb. So rb is the extension for Ruby files. Where it says save as type, we do not want .txt added to our file name because that will keep it from running. So we're gonna click on that and go to all files and that won't be, ended, that won't be added anymore. Go ahead and save it. 
And you'll notice over here, we now have practice at the top there. So this is where we click in the PowerShell window and type out Ruby to let it know we're running a Ruby program and then the name of your file with the extension, so .rb. When you hit enter, you should get hello world or whatever you put in there. Now PowerShell is not case sensitive. If you're using a Linux terminal, that is case sensitive. When you're writing your code for Ruby, Ruby is case sensitive. Just to show, we're gonna go ahead and capitalize puts. And from here on out, when I save a file, I'm gonna use Control S and you'll notice there's a little asterisk before the title of the file there. When I hit Control S, that star goes away. So that's how you know that I'm saving the file. And then over in the PowerShell window, I'm gonna use the up arrow. I'm gonna use the up and down arrows in a PowerShell window, it'll go back and forth between lines that you've already typed. So it's a nice shortcut, especially when you're doing your troubleshooting and deb debugging. So now when I hit enter, we get an error message. So even a short little program like this can pick up an error message pretty easy. And it can be kind of hard at first to learn what the error messages mean and learn how to fix them, but it's just a matter of practice. In this case, you see our error is an undefined method. That's because there is no method with the capital P, only lowercase. You also see down here, it has little carrots to show which part of my program is giving it trouble. And sometimes they'll even give suggestions as how to fix whatever is causing the error message. And that might be helpful, it might not be. So again, we've got a bug in our program now. And taking the bugs out of your program is called debugging. And quite frankly, it's gonna be the bulk of the time you spend writing programs. It's not actually the writing the program itself, it's fixing it. So we'll go ahead and make that lower case. Again, I'm hitting Control S to make that star go away and to save the file. Over in the PowerShell window, I'll hit up again to bring up my last line, hit enter, and there we go. And that is our first program in Ruby. Let's talk about our little program for a bit. It's basically got two parts. The first part, puts, is a method. When you wanna do something in Ruby, you're probably gonna to need to use a method. When a method is a part of the Ruby language, they say it's part of the standard library, so you might hear that around a bit. The second part is a string. A string, generally speaking, is a collection of characters that you can display on the screen. So sometimes you'll be working with numbers and you'll want to put those on the screen and you'll need to convert them to a string before you can do that. So there's a couple of other ways we can put strings onto the display. Puts is just one. Another one we can use is print. They're basically the same except print will not go to the next line where puts will. So just to demonstrate, I'm gonna go ahead and save this, come over to PowerShell and run it. And you can see we have hello world on a line by itself, but then puts takes us to the next line it says hi world, but because print does not take us to the next line, by world shows up on the same line. So again, puts and prints are basically the same, except print does not take you down to the next line. And there's reasons you'd want to use either one. There's also P and PP. No, I'm not kidding. Um, they will act just like puts, except they can give you some extra information about variables, so they're generally used for debugging, and we'll look at one of those a little bit later too. So that was a very quick look at how to output a string to the display. Don't worry, our strings will get a bit more complicated as we go.
but next I'd like to look at getting user input from the screen. And the method for that is gets. So let's write a small program using gets. Let's say enter your name. I'm using print so that way the user input will appear on the same line as the instruction. And we'll say, your name is, and because gets will return a string as well, we can use the plus sign to add the two strings together or concatenate them. Okay. So we'll save it and run it. Enter your name. Your name is Charlie. It looks like what we want. And for right now it is, but there's a bit more going on behind the scenes that might affect things later. So this will actually be a good opportunity to use the P method. So I'm just going to turn puts into P. And we'll save it. And we'll run it again. And your name, Charlie. Your name is Charlie. Now you see this time we've got double quotes around it. And there's also a backslash n, or some people say the whack in the programming language, so whack n. That is the escape sequence for a carriage return. So anytime you do input uh, with the enter key, you're going to have a carriage return put at the end of whatever you are entering. And you usually don't want that, although in this case it didn't matter. So let's look at what we do to get rid of that extra carriage return. We use puts again. Well, actually, we need to use p in order to see what we're doing. But the way we do that is we do dot chomp. So that chomp will chomp off any extra white space at the end of user input. Let's go ahead and save it. Run it again with the p. And you see now it's in double quotes, your name is Charlie, and that extra carriage return is not there. So that is how you'd get user input using gets and how you would cut off the extra carriage return on your user input. There's a bunch more we can do with input and output with things like files and events, but I'd like to get us to a point where we can write some interesting programs by the end of the video. So I like to move on to variables. Variables are what we use to store and manipulate data. Some common data types that we're going to use in our variables for Ruby include numbers, strings, arrays, etc. A whole bunch more that aren't listed, but we're not going to even cover what's there. So keep that in mind. And if you're coming from other languages, of particular note is there's no character type and no Boolean type. And when I say type, I mean there's no class to define that type of data. So there's no character class or Boolean class natively as part of Ruby. Of course, you can always write your own. So in place of those, you'd probably be using string in place of character. And instead of Booleans, what we have is a true class and a false class. We're not gonna get too much further into it than that. It's just worth knowing. We will be discussing Boolean expressions a little bit later though. Variables in Ruby are dynamically typed, which means you don't need to declare what kind of data it holds ahead of time. Plus, the data in a variable can change types over the course of a program. So this is very different from other statically typed languages like C++ and Java, where you need to declare a variable and what kind of data it holds before you can use it. And that type cannot change over the course of a program. If you need to do, do some kind of conversions, you'd have to use a method and store it in a different type of variable typically. So that's how most of my education went in college. It was almost entirely with statically typed languages. And you need a lot more code, but at the same time, when it's time to compile your program, you get a lot more useful errors, which is useful for debugging. So with a language like Ruby, there's a lot less code involved and a lot more freedom but that can also be more rope to hang yourself when it comes time to debugging and finding your mistakes. So it's a double-edged sword. In an object-oriented programming language like Ruby, 
everything is an object, including your basic variables, which means your variable will belong to a class, which is described by properties and methods that can be used with it. And the methods and properties of your variable will depend on what kind of data it holds. So we'll be doing a whole bunch of method calls on variables. And again, it'll depend on what is in that variable. If you go looking up types of variables on the internet, you're going to get something like local, instance, class, and global, which refers to the scope of a variable. So in other words, some variables you'd only use in a small loop of a couple lines, where other variables you might be using across multiple files. We're not going to get into scope today too much, but maybe in another video. The first type of data we'll discuss is numbers, and we'll throw nil in there as well. There's two primary types of number data, and those are integers and floating point numbers, or floats as most people will call them. Others include complex, big decimal, and rational, but we're not going to talk about those types today. You can use integers and floats together in an expression, but keep in mind that each type has their own methods associated with it. Although basically if you use a floating point method on an integer, you'll just get the integer back depending on what that method is. So if you're trying to round five to the nearest integer, you're just gonna get five. Incidentally, if your expression only contains integers, you're gonna get an integer back. So if you were to say take nine divided by five, you're gonna get one because five only goes into nine one time. If you're to take 9.0 divided by five, now it's gonna return a float and I think it's 1.8. So again, keep in mind if you mix the two together, you'll usually get a return of a float. If you only have integers, you're gonna get a return of an integer and it might not give you the result you're expecting. Some more on integers. An integer is basically a whole number, which can be positive, negative, or zero. There are two subclasses of integers, and those are fixed num and big num, and we're not gonna get into those today. If you wanted to try to convert an object into an integer, a lot of classes will have a dot two underscore i to make the attempt. So strings have a dot two i method that will let you try to turn it into an integer, although if it's just letters, it'll usually be zero. If you have a floating point, it'll basically cut off everything after the decimal point. Floating point numbers are just numbers with a decimal point, which can also be positive, negative, or zero. So you'd have 0, 0.0 as your floating zero. If you wanted to try to convert something into a float, again, you can use dot two underscore F this time to attempt to convert an object into a float. So again, it depends on what type of data you're using and whether or not its class has a dot to underscore whatever in order to attempt the conversion. In fact, if you create your own classes and you want to tr turn a dog into an integer, you can include your own dot to underscore i, and then you have to describe in your method how you'd convert your dog into an integer, and that'll be entirely up to you, and maybe we'll discuss that in the next class. So in addition to integers and floats, we're going to talk about nil very briefly here. And again, nil is its own type of object. It is not a number. It is not zero. What it is is the absence of a value. So if you try to do something with nil, like add it to something or multiply, whatever, it's not going to work because you can't do math with nil. Incidentally, nil is considered falsy if you were to include it in a Boolean expression, which is just something to note. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. So from there, let's go ahead and start working with some numbers. Go ahead and bring up the notepad and our PowerShell window. And we'll start off with the basic arithmetic. So plus, minus, star, and forward slash are how you do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division respectively. We'll go ahead and assign some things to x. So let's say x equals uh, 3 plus 4 puts x. Now even though x has an integer here, if it's just an integer or a floating point in your put statement, 
it knows to try to convert that into a string. So like I said earlier, puts is for putting strings on the display, and even though seven is not a string, Ruby knows to convert it. So let's go ahead, run it, and sure enough, we get seven. Now, as I said before, if you have a floating point mixed in with your expression, even if it's point zero, your result is gonna turn into a floating point. So we'll run it again. This time we're adding 4.0, and now we get 4.0, or 7.0. So let's try something else. Let's say we wanted to do, like I said before, 9 divided by 5. And I said before, if you're only using integers, you're going to get an integer returned. And because 5 goes into 9 one time, like I said, you should expect to get 1. And all you got to do is add a decimal point to one of these numbers. And now you're getting a floating point result. So again, this is one of those things that can trip you up in a dynamically typed language. Whereas in something statically typed, everything would be so explicit that you'll know what to expect before you actually go test it out. So multiplication also works the way you'd expect. Let's move on to exponents. To do an exponent, you use two stars. So three star star two would be three up to the second power or three squared. We run it, sure enough, we get nine. Another one that you may not be aware of if you've never done any programming is the modulus symbol. So we'll do 20. Modulus is expressed with the percent sign and we'll do three. So 20 modulus three should be two. And sure enough, because 3 times 6 would be 18, but 3 times 7 would put you over. So 20 minus 18 is 2. And there you go. And that's useful for doing things with rows and columns. I won't get too much into it, but there are actually a lot of uses for modulus. We've been using the equal sign here, and maybe it comes naturally to you, or maybe it just doesn't make sense. Equals in programming is usually the assignment operator. It doesn't actually mean one side is equal to the other. What it means is you're setting the right expression to the left variable. So everything goes from right to left with the assignment operator. Again, that's what the equal sign is for. It doesn't symbolize equivalency. And when we do some Boolean expressions, we actually use a double equal sign to uh, basically check whether or not two things are equal. We'll get to that in a bit. So some other things we can do with numbers are call methods on them. And like I said before, what kind of methods you can call on a number depends on what kind of number it is. So with integers, something you might do is ask if it's odd or even. And all you do with that is go dot odd and add a question mark. We'll save it. 20 is not odd. And sure enough, we have a false returned. If we were to do 21, that would be true. There is also an even function that does basically the same thing. I won't waste our time. Another one, perhaps worth knowing, is greatest common denominator. And that goes dot GCD. And then if we were to say, well, 21 is actually not a good number to use. Let's use 20. And then GCD in parentheses, you'd put the number that you're checking it against. Save, run, and sure enough, it's 10. And that checks out. Now, like I was saying before, there is a an automatic or implicit conversion that goes on because x is an integer but puts only works with strings. Now if the integer is by itself, 
puts knows what to do with it. But let's say we wanted to work with a string and say, say x equals, and then we'll try to show what x is after the fact with the plus sign. We run that and it gives us an error because now it doesn't do that implicit conversion. So what we would do is do dot to underscore s, which will attempt to convert x into a string and it should work because integers can be turned into strings with the proper method. And now when we run it, we get x equals 10, which is what we want. Just to show some float methods, let's go ahead and do 21.4. And now dot C-E-I-L, which stands for ceiling. What that will do is it will attempt to round the decimal point up. So this should be 22 because the next integer up is 22. Let's go ahead and run that. We'll leave the conversion in there as well because you can convert a floating point to a string as well. And sure enough, we get 22. As you might guess, you can also use floor, which will do the opposite, and that should bring us down to 21. Run it. Sure enough. And one other one we'll have a look at is round. And what round will do is attempt to round to a specific decimal point position. So I'm going to go ahead and type out 45.67. And let's say we want to round that. So if we just do dot round, it's going to, going to attempt to turn that into an integer. So it'll round it at the decimal point. Go ahead and save that. Run it. And sure enough, we get 46 because it's going to round up because 0.67 is more than halfway up. Something else we can do is round to a different decimal spot. So let's go ahead and try rounding one decimal position. So we'll save that, run it, and that goes to 45.7, which sure enough, because 7 is more than halfway, it'll round that first decimal point up to 0.7. So you can go one, two, three, four, five, whatever, depending on how many decimal places you have. You can also go negative, which will go to the left of the decimal point. So if I were to go to negative one, save it, run it. That brings us up to 50 because again, five in the ones position is more than halfway to four. So it goes up to 50. And that is some basics of working with integers. I'm going to throw in a little bit of bonus here and show you how to do random numbers as well. Before I do that, over in the PowerPoint window, we're going to type clear to get everything cleared away. And let's say we want to generate a random number just with the rand method. When you do that, it's going to return a number, a floating point number, between 0 and 1. So if I were to save that, run it, oops, got to go back two lines, this is what we get. And there might be reasons why you might just want a random floating point number, but generally speaking, you want an integer. So let's go ahead and put an integer in here. The integer we put in here will not be included in the range. So basically you're gonna get an integer, let's say we wanted to do a dice roll and we put in six. Oops. What we're actually gonna get is a random number from zero to five. So I know that might not make sense, but that's how it works. We'll run it. We got zero. Try running it again. We get one. Run it again, four, run it again. Again, we'll go up to five, we will not get six. 
So let's say we did want to do an actual dice roll and get a number between 1 and 6 instead of between 0 and 5. What we can do here is include a range instead. So if we were to go 1, dot, dot, 7, that will give us a range from 1 to 6. So you don't actually get that right number again in your range. You get the first number and then up to the second number minus 1. So we'll save it, and we'll run it, and sure enough, we're able to get six on the first shot there. So very useful for all sorts of things, including uh, encoding and game development. Again, just a simple little thing to throw in with the numbers section. So there you go. We'll start to look at strings next. We've already looked at strings a little bit, so I will forego the strings slide in the interest of time. And let's just go ahead and set a variable equal to a string. How about hello world again? And we will put that variable, save it, run it. Oops. There we go. We're up and running. So this is a string, and we say it is delimited by double quotes. Delimited means it's started and ended with. So the double quotes would be called delimiters. So let's say we were to throw these delimiters inside of the string. So we'll say hello Charlie's world. We'll throw Charlie's in double quotes. Save it. Run it. And sure enough, Ruby gets confused. Basically, it thinks everything between the first and second double quotes is going into the x variable, and everything after that is just gobbledygook that it doesn't know what to do with, and that's what's causing the error. So in this case, we have to do something called escaping the double quotes, which will help treat the double quotes inside the string like regular double quotes and not as delimiters. In Ruby, we do that with the backslash or the whack. So backslash backslash, save, run, and sure enough, now we've got Charlie's in double quotes, and it's as if these backslashes aren't even there. There's also something called escape sequences, where we use the backslash with a letter in order to indicate other types of formatting. Uh, there's a bunch, but we'll just go through the white space ones. So we've already looked at backslash n for a carriage return or new line, but there's also backslash t for a tab and backslash s for a space. So we'll go ahead and do a tab, hello, a space, world, new line, yay. We'll put an exclamation point on that, why not? Save it, run it, and sure enough, we have a tab at the beginning, a space in between the words, and yay on its own new line. So it looks kind of funky, but that's a nice way to shorten up the strings so they don't dominate your whole program where you've got all these loops and conditional statements and variable assignments, and you don't need a whole half page of string blocking the way. You can shorten it up nice and easy with the escape sequences. So as we already covered, but we'll cover it again, you can use a plus sign to concatenate strings. So let's say we say um, x equals hello with a space, y equals world, and then we'll say z equals x plus y puts z, which should be hello plus world. Yay, just as we'd expect. We also did a little bit with integers already as well. So let's say hello um, 100 worlds. So hello, and in between we'll have a 
equals 100. And then we'll need a space before worlds. Save it. Oops. Let's put the 100 in there first. A plus Y. Save it again. Run it. And sure enough, we've got that error that we should have been expecting because we need to convert this integer into a string to underscore s. Save it. Run it. And there we go. Now there's another way to go about doing things too, as far as using variables inside of strings. Just to make things a little easier to see here, we'll go ahead and do hello plus a plus worlds. Oops, put the space in the wrong spot there. Okay, so we still have that going. Now we can put this variable inside of the string rather than adding three different strings together, and a lot of people prefer that. To do that requires something called interpolation, where the variable is interpolated into a string inside of the string. And to do that, we do the number sign, and then a left bracket, and the variable, then the right bracket. And this should work for a whole bunch of different kinds of variables. Uh, or data types rather. We go ahead and run that and it looks just like before except now it's a little bit cleaner. So double quotes are one way to denote a string and when you have double quotes it'll do that interpolation with both the variables and the escape sequences for that matter. But you can also use other delimiters for your strings for instance, single quotes. Now the thing with single quotes is it will not do interpolation. So it will not turn this number sign uh, annotation for the variable into 100. It's just going to spit out what's right there. So it'll take it literally. So we have hello and then everything worlds. So that is something that distinguishes double quotes and single quotes. Also, because we're using single quotes as the delimiter, if we throw a single quote inside of the string, save it, run it. Once again, we're confusing Ruby and we need to escape that single quote. So we're gonna clear this up run it, and now we've got our apostrophe or single quote as we'd like it because it's being escaped. Another way you can delimit a string is with, well, I'm not sure what it's called, but we'll call it Q notation. What we do here is we use a percent sign. Now you don't need a Q, if you don't put it there, it's assumed to be a capital Q. So it's capital Q by default if you leave it out. In fact, we'll leave it out for the first shot. But when you use the percent sign, you can use a different delimiter like uh, the exclamation point, brackets, parentheses, whatever. We'll use parentheses because I think that's probably the most common. But we can do hello world and parentheses. Save it. Run it and it acts just like the double quotes. So again, you can also use a capital Q, save it, run it, there we go. Again, we can do the number sign annotation. Save it, run it. And if we used a lowercase q, it treats the string as though it were contained in uh, single quotes, so it won't do the interpolation. Just to show it, we'll save it, run it, and there you go. 
just to show we can use another delimiter. We'll use the exclamation points. In programming worlds, sometimes they call it the bang. I actually kind of like that. So you've got the whack and the bang. It's kind of violent, but easier to say. So we'll run it with the exclamation points. And again, we're running it as if it was single quoted. So that is a whole bunch to know about strings. We'll have a look at just a few of the methods just so you know you can do it. So we'll go ahead, oops. We'll go ahead and puts hello world. One thing we do is check the length. So you just put dot length after your string, save it, run it, we get 11. Again, this is an integer, but puts knows to convert an integer into a string if that's all that there's, that's there. And as far as Ruby is concerned, there is no hello world here. It's just the number 11. Another thing we can do, you know, we'll just keep using the same line. Uh, incidentally, size does the same thing. So if you do size, it's a little, a little shorter. You can also do uh, conversion to lowercase and uppercase. So if we were to do dot uppercase, save, run it. Oops, uh, upcase. Not uppercase, upcase, so that is a misspelling on my part. There we go. It's in all caps. And this works if you're just using a variable as well, because as far as Ruby's concerned, the variable translates exactly to what's in it. So if we do x equals hello world, and then puts x dot upcase, we get the same thing. So there's a bunch of other methods that you can use with strings for uh, finding what's inside it, for doing different forms of concatenation, but I'm gonna leave it right there. Uh, you can feel free to look at the rest of the documentation on your own to see what other methods there are for this and for any of the other classes we've discussed. And you do that by going to the website ruby.lang.org, actually Ruby dash lang.org and that's the official website for the ruby language you go digging around in that website and you can find the documentation i'm not connected to the internet right, not right now which is why i'm typing it out in notepad i was planning to get to arrays and loops in this video however i'm already way over my 30 minute target so i'm going to finish up with conditional statements just so we have enough code under our belt to program something interesting and we'll cover everything else in another video. So conditional statements can take several forms. However, today we're going to just focus on the if statement. So I'm going to go ahead and set a variable to a value. And we'll go ahead and test against it with an if statement. So we start off with if, and then follow that with what's called a Boolean expression, which is an expression that evaluates to true or false. In this case, let's do if x is less than 50. So after the expression, you type up any code that you want to execute if that expression evaluates to true. Do puts x is less than 50. It can be multiple lines, but I think that's enough for now. Now if you type all your code out, you type end to close off the if statement. And it is convention to indent your code blocks inside of your if statements just for readability. So we'll go ahead and save it, run it. And sure enough, x equals 10, 10 is less than 50. Thus, we get our statement to print out that x is less than 50. Let's go ahead and copy that, paste it, this time we'll test for greater than 50. Save it, run it. And the first statement still prints, but the second one does not because X is not greater than 50. 
one more time. This time we'll test for equality. To test for equality, you'd use back-to-back -back equal signs. So one equal sign is the assignment operator. Two equal signs is the test for equality. Let's make sure the words are right. Save it, run it, and sure enough, the first statement is still the only one that prints out because the other two expressions evaluate to false. If we were set x to 50, save it, run it. This time the final statement is the only one that prints because the final expression is the only one that evaluates to true. So there's a way we can shorten this up and that's with the else if and else keywords. So instead of ending each statement here, what we're gonna do is do if x is less than 50, do that, else if x is greater than 50, and that is how you spell else if, E-L-S-I-F, if you try spelling it any other way, you're gonna get near. And in place of the last and if, we're just gonna do else, and we don't need to test for equality because we're already testing for less than and greater than, so all that's left is equality, so we'll save it, run it, and again, just the last statement prints out because the first two statements are false. So there's a couple of other ways we can test things out. This time let's test for less than or equal to 50. Make sure the words match. Greater than or equal to 50. And we can also test for not equal to 50. So let's go ahead and do else if x and to test for inequality it is exclamation point then the equal sign and that we're then what you're testing against so bang equal sign is the same as not equal to so depending on how savvy you are about if statements what prints out might surprise you we'll go ahead and save it run it and you'll notice we only get the first statement, even though that second expression evaluates to true. And that's because once you do the first Boolean expression in the if statement and it evaluates to true, everything else gets skipped. So if it was the second expression that evaluates to true, then it would have been the third expression that got skipped. So that's just a little thing to pay attention to. In the if then else statement, only the first expression that evaluates to true is going to execute. So with the if statements, you can also nift, uh, nest more if statements in with them. So you can form a hierarchy of if statements. Make sure to only go one step at a time because it can get very confusing which statements are supposed to execute once you start getting things really complicated with your conditional statements. So there is one other thing I'd like to cover for our if statements, and that is when you combine Boolean expressions. So let's go ahead, we'll start from scratch here, and there's two ways you can combine Boolean expressions, and that is with the and and sign, and that will combine the expressions for expression one evaluating to true and expression two evaluating to true. There is also the pipe pipe symbol, which is or. So that would mean either the first expression must evaluate to true or the second statement must evaluate to true. So just to do an example here, we'll do and and. Um, I'm not feeling very original right now, so we'll just do five is equal to five. puts statement or expression is true end 
So if the first expression is true and the second one is true, then this should be executed. So let's go ahead and save it, run it, and sure enough it is true because x equals 50, so the first expression is true and the second one is 5 equals 5, which is of course true. So this is all true and this executes. If I were to change this to 5 is equal to 4, save it, run it, you see the statement is not printed. If we were to change this to OR, the first expression is still true, so it doesn't matter that the second expression is false. This should still execute and print the statement, which it does. While we're here, if you are testing things out, and again, you're like me and not feeling very creative, any number will evaluate to true. So if I were to type 5 here and no equality or less than or equals to or anything like that, just save it, run it, you see it still evaluates to true. Heck, we can pull this out. So just if 5, save it, run it. Again, the number itself by itself evaluates to true. Any number evaluates to true. And if you're coming from another programming language, even 0 evaluates to true, which is not true in most other languages. Usually 1 is true and 0 is false when dealing with Booleans. But in this case, all numbers evaluate to true. What does evaluate to false is nil. So if you need to make something false, again, for testing purposes or whatever, you can go ahead and use nil in the place of a false uh, expression. Saved. Run it. Now it does not evaluate. But you'll notice we don't get an error message either. So that is all I've got for today. I apologize for not covering everything that I had planned, but that just means there's more content for the next videos. I hope that you learned something and had a little fun and are excited about learning more, and I hope you have a good day.